That's Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 to 30, page 143. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now, two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them? And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Acts chapter 2, 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, as of fire, appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thanks, Jen, very much for reading. Please keep Acts 2 open, and you'll find on the inside of your sheet a handout 
uh, which you might find useful for our time together. Let me introduce myself. My name is Tim, uh, also on the staff team here, and I serve particularly with students. So let me say a strong welcome to you, but welcome to anyone, uh, particularly those for whom this is one of your first times at St. Helens. I wonder if you've been imagining, like me, what life will be like in 20 years' time, looking back on these days, uh, these days that we're in. Will COVID have transformed society, or will we basically have forgotten all about it? One thing that has definitely had a lasting global impact is the invention of the internet. Back in 1989, Tim Berners-Lee was a software engineer working for CERN, the particle physics laboratory in Switzerland. And he realized that the whole team was having difficulty sharing information. Turns out Tim Berners-Lee was the kind of guy who, within two years, had invented the internet. It's quite impressive, isn't it? Can you imagine being there at the heart of something so globally significant as the invention of the internet? Our passage tonight tells us that if we're Christians, we don't need to imagine being at the heart of something so globally significant. Something huge has happened and far more significant than the internet. And we are there at the center of it. Maybe you felt a bit of a um, significance in this passage already. If you were here last week, you'd have heard me call it one of the most important passages in the New Testament. And it certainly had a big buildup in the book of Acts. From the very beginning of Acts, Jesus has been trailering this moment that we've just read about. He said in chapter 1, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that excitement builds then into chapter 2. As Luke starts to set the scene, verse 1, it's Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks. We're seven weeks after Passover, seven weeks after Jesus died and rose again. It's something like the 23rd of May. 33 AD. And as Jesus' followers are all gathered, something remarkable happens. Uh, There is a massive noise. You know that sort of noise, a huge bang that makes everybody turn. Except this time it's not a bang, but verse 2, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And in case any of us are still wondering what's causing it, verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Even if you know nothing about the Holy Spirit, and that might be many of us this evening, this description of the the event sets it up as a big deal, doesn't it? The large crowds that were gathered in Jerusalem back then seemed to pick up on it. Verse 6, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed and astonished. Or as verse 12 puts it, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And that is the key question for us this evening. What does this mean? It's a question I guess lots of us have. Uh, Maybe because you've heard lots of teaching on this chapter or teaching about the Holy Spirit and you've already got loads of ideas of what this means. Or maybe because you're very confused about the Spirit and you've got no idea what to expect as we come to Acts 2. Either way, what does it mean? A great question for us to answer. And we want God's answer to that question, don't we? You don't want mine or anyone else's. We want what God says in the Bible to answer that question, which is why it's great that Peter gives us that answer. Uh, The Apostle Peter, God's hand-picked witness, uh, an answer that stretches over two weeks, so please come back next week as well. Uh, We've only got time for the first half this evening, Uh, but even the first half of his answer tells us that we are looking at an event of earth-shattering significance. What does it mean? Well, firstly, the Spirit has come on every Christian The Spirit has come on every Christian. Look at verse 14 with me. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And on he goes. 
Uh, Peter says they're not drunk, as some people were suggesting. No, this is the fulfillment of what Jesus had been talking about a few weeks before. Uh, this, in fact, is the fulfillment of something more than that, Joel's great Old Testament prophecy. This is the fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, is the third person of the Trinity. Uh, the Bible teaches we have one God who has eternally existed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we give lots of attention to the first two, but then some people think the third is just a force or a power. No, he is also a person who's fully God, as much as the Father and the, Spirit, uh, the Son, and has existed in perfect unity with them for eternity past. He's mentioned throughout the Bible, even from the very first chapter, And I guess some of us might take news of the Holy Spirit here for granted, but one of the key things you would know about the Holy Spirit, if you knew your Old Testament really well, is that he was only given to a few people before the time of Jesus. You may have picked up on that from our reading in Numbers 11. The Spirit was often at work, he was often amongst the people, but he only chose to live in or rest upon a few, generally people who did special tasks for God. For example, those who led God's people or who Um, who were prophets, or in the case of Moses, both. Having God live in you by his Spirit is a privilege that just a few people had before Jesus. And yet, as we saw in that reading from Numbers 11, Moses wanted everyone to enjoy that privilege. When Joshua was complaining about the fact the Spirit seemed to be on too many people, Moses said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his Spirit on them. Of course he did. Moses saw what an amazing thing it would be for everyone to get God living in them. And then, about a thousand years later, the prophet Joel said exactly that was going to happen. Peter quotes it in verse 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Do you see the idea? that The day would come when the the spirit would be poured out on all of God's people, regardless of who they were, male or female, young or old, whatever their status, wherever they're coming from, they would get the spirit. It was a huge promise. And at 9 a.m. that Pentecost, something like 23rd of May, 33 AD, you could find it on your calendar app if you scrolled back for long enough. At 9 a.m. on that day, that promise got fulfilled. The Spirit was poured out on every Christian. For the first time in history, God the Holy Spirit came to dwell in every one of his people. Now, we need to be careful in the book of Acts because there's lots in Acts that is unique. As we were seeing last week, the apostles at the center of the action were a a unique hand-picked group of people. Uh, This book describes events which kick-started the church, and so it's describing, not prescribing. Its events are unique. They're not always normal. Indeed, even the way that the Spirit came in this chapter is unique. Every other time that he is described as coming in Acts... It is never narrated like it is here in verses 1 to 3. But the Holy Spirit really is for every single Christian. I look at the end of Peter's sermon and our theme verse for this evening. Peter said to them, uh, this is chapter 2 verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Yes, this is a unique moment in history, but it's produced a massive change. From now on, the moment anyone becomes a Christian, the Spirit always comes to live in them. And that means that if you're a Christian, you have God living in you. Some people doubt that they've got the Holy Spirit. And so go looking for some other proof to confirm whether they've got him. Maybe looking for a warm feeling or a tingly sensation or something else. But the Spirit has come on every Christian. And that is what Joel and Peter, what the whole Bible teaches. So there's really a very simple test to see if you have have the Holy Spirit. You ready for this? Ask yourself, am I a Christian? 
That's it. Do you trust Jesus? Have you repented and believed? Have you turned and trusted in Jesus as your king? If you haven't, and that will be some of us here today, let me encourage you to do so, or at least to find out why he's worth turning to, and maybe grab Charlie Rylish or anyone else you know. Uh, look at one of the biographies of Jesus, as they did. And indeed, our small groups that we were talking about earlier give a great opportunity for that. If you haven't turned to trust in Jesus, well, check him out. It's the best decision you could make. But if you have done that, well, then you have the Holy Spirit. You are caught up into this momentous moment in history. You have God living in you. Over the past week, the news has been saturated with stories about Emma Raducanu, the 18-year-old tennis player who won the US Open. And while lots of the stories have focused on how young she is, one of the fascinating things is how she started the tournament. I guess many of us will have picked up on this. She started as a qualifier. It means she was so unrecognized that she had to qualify for a place in the US Open. She was the first qualifier to even reach a Grand Slam final, let alone win one. Up until that point, Grand Slam finals were just the private domain of those who had some standing in the tennis community, those whose ranking was high enough to earn them a place. Nobody's never made the cut. And in one tournament, she went from being effectively a nobody to being the winner of the US Open. Of course, actually, she was a very capable tennis player. We saw that at Wimbledon, those who've been following, she'd proven that. She just hadn't been recognized. But on this Pentecost morning, genuine nobodies, insignificant, run-of-the-mill Christians like you and me, were suddenly filled with the presence of God himself by his Holy Spirit. God came to live in all his people. But maybe you're asking why. Why has God the Holy Spirit been poured out on every believer? In the Old Testament, he was given for particular uh, special tasks. For what purpose has the Spirit come now? Well, that's point two on the handout, if you're still following there. The Spirit has come on every believer to make us prophets. Of all the things the Bible has to say about the work of the Spirit, uh, that one thing is clear in our passage, isn't it? Verse 17, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy you see prophecy there at the beginning verse 17 the end of verse 18 the spirit has come to make us prophets but that doesn't really answer the question does it I guess some of us are going well thanks Tim that's not really cleared anything up because uh, people have loads of different ideas of what being a prophet means. In fact, the Bible uses the language of prophets in a few different ways. But as we see exactly what Acts 2 is talking about, we'll see, well, even more a sense of how significant this moment really is. Firstly, being a prophet means speaking. Now, that's what they're doing, isn't it? Verse 4, they began to speak. Verse 7, they heard them speak. Verse 11, they were telling in our own tongues, the mighty works of God. Being a prophet here is clearly about speaking. Indeed, that's what being filled with the Spirit is basically always about. Uh, you could check out later that list of all the times that Luke, in his writings, uses the language of being filled with the Spirit. And every single instance, I think, when I check them all this, this week, is either about someone who immediately then speaks or about someone who goes on to speak. The Spirit has been given to us to make us prophets, that is, those who speak. And as with the Old Testament, God has given us something particular to speak. God's prophets speak his word. In the Old Testament, that came through dreams and visions. That's why Joel picked up on that language in his quotes. He's not saying some of us are young enough to see visions, and then when you reach a certain age, you can't stay awake, so you dream dreams instead. Naming no names this week. No, Numbers 12, printed on the handouts, helps us to understand what dreams and visions are really about. At Numbers 12 on the handouts, God said, Hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Do you see what's going on? 
It's really about God making himself known. So in the Old Testament, that meant literally dreams and visions. But as Hebrews tells us, we don't need to go looking for other ways of God communicating anymore because he's made himself known in an even greater way, in the person of Jesus. Now, that's why Peter doesn't spend the rest of his talk focusing on dreams or visions, but on Jesus. Either the things that God promised about Jesus in the Old Testament or his own apostolic witness, what made up the New Testament. We don't need to go looking for dreams and visions because we have something far better here in God's word, the Bible, the full and final revelation of the Lord Jesus. As Eilish said earlier, everything we need to know from God is here. And now that the Spirit has come, every single Christian has been empowered to speak this, this word of the Lord to others. That is a huge deal. A huge deal. Think about the Old Testament. God's word was a privilege that just a few could speak it. Think of the big names you know from the Old Testament, if you know the Old Testament at all. Uh, Names like Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Zechariah. Names that we might find out Luke has gone for, for his new baby. But ever since the day the Spirit came, every single believer has been empowered by the Spirit to be a prophet, to speak God's word to others. All of us have become Bible speakers. Now we need to work out what that means in practice in just a few minutes. But perhaps you're wondering if we should all be speaking it in tongues. After all, verse 4 says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Some people suggest that having the Spirit is about speaking unrecognizable heavenly languages. But for a start, these tongues weren't heavenly languages, were they? They were human ones. Verse 6, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Again, in verse 11, halfway through the verse, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. They were human languages. But more than that, speaking in tongues isn't normal for every Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 makes that plain, and you can check out those verses later. Not every Christian can speak in tongues. In fact, even in the book of Acts, it's incredibly rare. And when it does come up, it seems to be about the good news of Jesus going to the ends of the earth, to people of every language. And that's why you get this amazing list of countries that was very well read for us in verses 9 to 11. In fact, that's also why I put a map on the handouts, where you get this kind of 360 degree tour of all of Jerusalem's first century neighbors. And the point is to say that the, the, the message of Jesus is going to the ends of the earth, exactly what Jesus had promised back in chapter 1. The Spirit has come on every Christian to make us prophets, speaking the Bible to the end of the earth. And that is a huge deal, a monumental shift in God's dealing with the world. If you know the Bible at all, maybe you've read back in Genesis When humanity were rebelling against God, it got so bad that God frustrated their languages and scattered them across the world. You can read about it in Genesis 10 and 11 at the Tower of Babel. From then on, God focused his saving work in the nation of Israel. But these verses in Acts 2 tell us that that's been reversed. Instead of frustrating their languages so that they can't understand one another, they speak in tongues so that everyone can understand. Instead of scattering them around the world, they are gathered in Jerusalem from all around Jerusalem. In fact, I'm told that list of nations, as well as being 360 degrees around Jerusalem, is a deliberate reminder of the list of nations back in Genesis 10. A hugely symbolic and visual demonstration of Babel being reversed. The Spirit has come on every single Christian to make us prophets, speaking the Bible to all the nations of the world. Babel is being reversed. This is a momentous moment, a huge deal. Suddenly, on that one morning, the great trajectory of history, the perspective of God's purposes have been transformed. And here's the extraordinary thing. 
If you are a Christian, then you're taken up into that project. You have the spirit to be a global Bible speaker. And that's why we're so committed to every member ministry speaking the Bible at St. Helens. Every one of us speaking the Bible to each other. It's why after our, our talk this evening, there'll be time to chat here and why we open St. Andrew's to have food so that we can chat to each other. You could have sermons all the way through the Old Testament. Indeed, you did. But since the Spirit has come, all of us are prophets. Every Christian is a Bible speaker. And not that all of us can preach. You might decide to tell me later that not all of us can preach, Tim. <laughs> but since Pentecost, every one of us can have Spirit-empowered conversations about the Bible. Uh, we don't think there's something special about me. Indeed, my big hope for every sermon is not that you'll get excited about this moment, but that it will set up great conversations afterwards as we chat to one another and as we go across the roads to St. Andrews and through the week. Indeed, that's why we run Bible studies the way that we do. We've just had a weekend away for our Bible study leaders, talking about what they're going to be doing in small groups this year. And one of the big things we often say to our Bible study leaders is that what we're aiming for is a discussion. Because every Christian has the Spirit. Every Christian is a prophet, a Bible speaker. And so we don't just want to hear from people like me or your, your Bible study leaders. Every Christian is a Bible speaker speaking these words to one another. You have something valuable to contribute, whether you realize it or not. And that is why we get together. Indeed, it's why we encourage every one of us to speak to friends and colleagues and course mates about the Lord Jesus. Because God's global project has enlisted every believer to its cause. God has come to live in every Christian to enable us to speak for him in the world. Each one of us has been given the Spirit to empower us to speak his word to the end of the earth. It doesn't mean that all of us will be brilliant at it. It doesn't mean that everything we say will be right. I'm pretty sure there'll be some things that I've said in the last 20 minutes or so that weren't quite right. You, as a spirit-empowered prophet, can go back to the Bible and see for yourself. But if any of us are waiting for permission, if I'm waiting to have the authority, if I'm waiting for a clear message from God to tell me whether I should be speaking about Jesus, well, God changed history. You can't get clearer than that. As the Holy Spirit came to live in every believer, God made every one of us prophets, speaking his word to the ends of the earth. History is filled with significant moments. Occasionally, a few of us get to be part of those moments. I don't know if anyone here was involved in finding a COVID vaccine. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the internet. Here, we have a far more significant moment. The moment that the Spirit was poured out on every believer to make us prophets. Those who speak the Bible to the ends of the earth. No longer was it limited just to a small patch of land, well, a sizable patch of land in the Middle East, but of spreading across the globe. And no longer just the right of a few but every one of his people. It's a huge deal. And if we're Christians, we have been caught up into the heart of it. And whether we feel like it or not, God has come to live in us. And he empowers us to speak his word here and across London and to the end of the earth. What a great thing. Let me lead us in prayer. Our Father, how we thank you that you are such a great and powerful God, uh, that you have done such wonderful and mighty things in history. And thank you for telling us about this great moment when you poured out your Spirit on all your people. Now, please, we pray, would you grant us just a glimpse of the significance of that moment? And would it help us to understand both what you are doing and help us to take up our part within it? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.